Hello everyone and welcome to the podcast of English composer Andrew Downs. My name is Paula Downs, I am Andrew's younger daughter and on today's show I will be reading chapter 6 from my granddad's book Around the Horn by Frank Downs. Chapter 6 covers Wing Commander Guy Gibson, Myrna and Ada Damraid, Welsh Guards Band Cardiff, Sir James Grigg, War Minister. During the years 1942-3, to though we continued to visit many RAF stations to give concerts, there was an increase in public parades, propaganda marches in support of the war effort, Wings for Victory, War Weapons Week and Navy Week, in which all three services were represented. Generally, these events were extremely well organised. They had to be, with tanks and aircraft on trailers sometimes being involved in the processions. One of our fears on such marches was of the stray dogs which would run in and out of the ranks, barking their heads off. I remember nearly falling base over apex when one ran in front of me. Not really funny when playing a French horn concentrating on the music and on the distance from the man in front. Our visit to Cardiff in May 1943 proved to be rather less than successful. A much publicised Wings for Victory parade had been organised and Wing Commander Guy Gibson, hero of the raid on the Myrna and Ada dams a few days previously, was to take the salute outside Cardiff Castle. A procession of enormous size assembled in the area of Central Station. RAF, Army, Navy, Fire Service, Civil Defence and contingents of the nursing profession were all marching behind us as we entered St Mary's Street. Two RAF military policemen led the way, about 15 yards in front of us. Our front rank trombone section had instructions to follow them down High Street to the T-junction of Castle Street and Duke Street and it was at that point that the calamity occurred. Civic dignitaries were assembled at the saluting base outside the castle awaiting our arrival but as we approached the said junction, horror of horrors, the military policemen wheeled right into Duke Street instead of left into Castle Street. Uncertain of what to do, our front rank followed and we had no alternative but to do likewise. Pandemonium reigned as the officer commanding the RAF contingent immediately behind us, realising what had happened, directed his men left towards the saluting base. The rest of the procession followed so that we, together with the two policemen, were completely isolated and marching the wrong way. The whole cavalcade came to a grinding halt about a quarter of a mile from the waiting notabilities, whilst with great embarrassment we were marched once more to the head of the procession. There was inevitable inquiry afterwards, which was, as ever, inconclusive. The trombones came in for a lot of stick, goodness knows why, they were following explicit instructions. We never knew what happened to the military policemen. Later in the week there was another parade which was more elaborate in as much as it involved tanks and aircraft on huge trailers. This time we were not marching but playing at the saluting base outside County Hall. The honour of leading the procession this time, appropriately enough, went to the band of the Welsh Guards with their splendid goat and goat major ten yards ahead of their front line. It was, as always, a marvellous spectacle. The plan, as far as the music was concerned, was that after the guards had passed, we should take over and play the rest of the procession by, as the various services took the salute. Sir James Grigg, the War Minister, was the VIP on this occasion, and as the procession approached, there was the customary air of excitement from the throngs of people lining both sides of the road. Everything seemed to be going perfectly, the goat major with his clockwork-like movements of arms and legs, and the goat proud and serene. He knew the way, even if we did not, a few days earlier. But wait, 
It was unbelievable. Directly in front of the war minister, the animal dropped anchor and refused to budge one inch. All down the line, one heard, Halt! 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 as contingents came to a sudden stop. The seconds ticked by and there was an atmosphere of suspended animation. Efforts were made to move the animal, but it was of no avail. Eventually it disgraced itself beyond description as it left its calling card in front of the Minister of War. Thus relieved, the offending goat continued on its way and several bandsmen picked their way through what it had left behind. Coincidentally, I was able to meet up with my brother Herbert as we moved on to play in towns along the coast of South Wales. Port Talbot, Swansea, Brangwen Hall, Llanethly and Carmarthen, on to Ammonford, Merthyr Tydfil, Pontypreeth and Neath and finally back to Cardiff where we were to play at the Park Hall. It was there I saw that the Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra with Malcolm Sargent was due to play on the following evening. As luck would have it, we had a free day and after several phone calls I learned that the orchestra was due at lunchtime at Central Station. Herbert had recently joined the newly formed Liverpool Orchestra as its principal viola. The offer of the post had come quite unexpectedly, apparently by a telegram, which read, Will you accept Principal Viola of the Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra and Philharmonia Quartet? It was an offer which he readily accepted after the BBC agreed to relinquish his contract in Glasgow. It is interesting to note, perhaps, the principal players who had left London to form the Liverpool Orchestra at that time. Henry Holst, leader, David Wise, Anthony Pinney and George Anthony in the string sections, Arthur Ackroyd, John McCarthy, Reginald Kell, Jack Alexander in the woodwind and Edmund Chapman, one of the great orchestral horn players of his generation. The orchestra was highly praised from the outset and I must say that on my first hearing in Cardiff I found their playing most impressive. The following year of 1944 saw greatly increased Allied Air Force attacks on Western Europe when 3,000 planes launched a dawn to dusk offensive on May the 1st. The RAF Bomber Command sent out 1,000 planes against seven targets and it was becoming obvious that the long-awaited second front landing in France was imminent when on May the 20th, 5,000 Allied planes attacked airfields, railways and other targets in France and Belgium. We toured many of the operational airfields at this time, giving concerts, and it was always a stimulating experience to play to these men and women. I have particularly nostalgic memories of May the 17th of that year. Iris was 21 on that very day, and we had, many months beforehand, agreed that we should become engaged on her 21st birthday. As luck would have it, I had a free day, but there was a snag. She was a telephone operator in the National Fire Service, and had recently been transferred to Colchester from the Midlands via Woking. I had been up to Colchester several times since she arrived there, but the problem now was that prior to the invasion, certain areas of East Anglia and the South Coast were restricted military zones. Colchester had been designated as an American sector, and my fear was that RAF personnel would not be allowed in without a pass. I left Liverpool Street Station in an intrepid mood, but it turned rather more towards trepidation as the train approached Colchester. I need not have worried. The two white-helmeted American military police waved me through the gate with cheerful smiles. We had a wonderful day together. Iris chose the ring from a jeweler's just off the high street, and after lunch, on a beautiful English summer day, we went off on a bus to nearby Halstead for the rest of the afternoon, before returning to the fire station in St Peter's Street for her night duty shift. I 
I sometimes find it difficult to believe my good fortune in meeting such a friendly bunch of firemen on that station. On many occasions I would stay the night. They found me a bunk in their sleeping quarters and frequently in the early hours of the morning the alarm would go and the sheer speed of the duty watch sliding down the pole and onto the engine, instantly ready for action, had to be seen to be believed. There was one member of the team who was unfailingly first on the engine, the station mascot, a black retriever dog by the name of Laddie. I caught the half-past midnight train to London on that memorable May the 17th, tired but extremely happy. I had to be back in camp by 0600 hours and making my way, or rather picking my way, along tube station platforms full of sleeping Londoners, for many it was their permanent shelter from night raids, I paused for a few minutes to look at an underground map, unsure of my route. Unfortunately, I had my hands in my pockets and an overzealous military policeman spotted me and charged me with the offence. And oh yes, I had a button undone on my tunic, a further offence of being improperly dressed at 4am on a tube station. A sad end to what had been a marvellous day. However, I continued to spend most of my off-duty time in Colchester, the journey from Liverpool Street being only just over the hour. I found it quite a pleasant town, with friendly people, though it was rather like entering another state of America. Army and Air Force personnel seemed to be everywhere. Its numerous pubs and hotels were always full to capacity, and I witnessed some ugly scenes once or twice when racial tension between black and white American soldiers resulted in violence. It was quelled by their military police by equally violent methods. There was, however, an air of calm and good humour in the town, when a rather balding Bing Crosby on a tour of the areas came to stay for a few days at the Cups Hotel and sang from a balcony to a huge audience of admirers in the High Street. My visits to Colchester ended in the autumn of that year when Iris was transferred back to the Midlands. Happy memories persist even today of that town and its fire station, temporary wartime. And I shall never forget the kind black American sergeant who on my final visit when I had missed my train to London, stopped his tank and gave me a lift as far as the Mile End Road. End of chapter 6 to end this podcast, I am going to play the first movement of Andrew Downs' Symphony No. 3, performed by the Czech Philharmonic Orchestra under Andrei Vrabets for the Artisman label. I will always remember the broad smile on my nana Iris's face when the drum kit started up in the premiere of this work. She was usually quite quiet and reserved, but she very obviously loved this piece. 